some people really do not need an introduction, and this certainly applies to Julian Barber. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, he's not only known to specialists, but also to people that love physics, even as a kind of popular subject uh, through his books. Um, I would say uh, probably virtually all of his work are uh, concerned with the question of time in one or the other way, and the idea that the time is an illusion, that it is nothing like flowing independently of us, but should be always put in the relation of the change of some dynamics of the systems we are observing. That resonates with some of the ideas we are also here following in Vienna. Uh, he also formalized this through the shape dynamics with his uh, uh, colleagues and co-authors, uh, and applying this to uh, uh, classical mechanics, but also uh, GR, and attempts to do it even in uh, constant gravity. He's also concerned with the history of science. Um, uh, known for his books, um, uh, The End of Time, which I think appeared in 1999, and I have a very good uh, memory of reading this book because through this book it came to me quite clear the idea of uh, not why you see uh, definite trajectories in the vacuum chamber, although the particles are quantum particles. It's, it's really very convincingly argued, and I actually warmly recommend reading this book if you have not that so far. And there is another book which is uh, the, uh, the discovery of dynamics. Um, uh, Julian resides in uh, North Oxfordshire. Uh, I guess this is the That's why uh, this is <laughs> your home. And he also has a very unusual, well, if I even may say this, career path. So I would read his own words about that. Um, um, he received his PhD, I forgot to say, in 68 from the University of Cologne um, on the work on the foundations of Einstein theory of uh, general relativity. Um, and he writes um, about that, I completed a PhD on the foundations of Einstein's general relativity in Cologne, at Cologne in 1986, uh, 18, uh, 68, sorry, and this is a German one, <laughs> and then decided to become independent Fearing that an academic environment and the associated pressure to publish as many research articles as possible would deflect me from my long term objectives. For, uh, at that time, for 28 years, I supported my family and research by translating Russian scientific journals. This left me free to develop, in collaboration with Teddy Brugger, um, at the time, the theory of time in New York. Okay. Well, uh, I don't know what you would do if you were now a young postdoc, but I think the situation has just uh, 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 went worse <laughs> in this aspect. And uh, uh, well, it shows also a kind of a personal character, your courage to take this path, and I appreciate this very much. So it's your stage. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here in Vienna. I was, I think I was last here in 1987 speaking at the 150th anniversary of Anne's last birth. Uh, uh, so it's, it's wonderful to be back. Let me just say for people who haven't heard it, I mean, I wouldn't be here if it been for my Italian collaborator years ago, Bruno Bertotti. By great good fortune, I visited him in September, just in time. He died four weeks later. Uh, a very distinguished uh, relativist, very involved in the development of experimental uh, gravity uh, before thinking in, in the 70s. Uh, so these are just my collaborators. I forgot to put down Flavia Bacati's uh, book on shape dynamics, which came out at the beginning of this year, it wasn't it? With Oxford University Press, uh, which is uh, uh, an important sort of summary of all the things uh, I've been involved with and with my various collaborators. Um, but let's get straight on to the, the subject. Um, I want to talk about, uh, I've given the title Laws of the Instant to, to this talk. That's an expression I get from Carol Kukash, those who know. Um, 
And it's to do with the fact that there are uh, elliptical equations in general relativity, which often don't get enough uh, uh, attention if one, one thinks too much of sort of evolution in time, whereas there are very important um, elliptical equations which hold across space like hypersurfaces. Now, there are two I think one of the great problems in talking about relativity is that there are two totally different meanings of relativity. Uh, the earlier one is due to Ernst Mach, uh, going right back to the discussions of Leibniz and, and Newton, uh, where you say that the... Um, how do I get the thing to point to the... Do I get it? Yes. So, Mach's idea was that reality is defined by the separations between particles. He wasn't questioning absolute simultaneity when he, he made those statements. So, the universe is given once only with its relative motions alone determinable. Uh, so, uh, that's one, of, one meaning of relativity. But then the Einstein one is quite different, that there are different definitions of simultaneity. There are different ways of uh, putting the... Um, cutting up space-time in, into that. So that, that's the relativity of simultaneity. And these are conceptually very different. And if you follow uh, the Markian one, you get a, a very different way of looking at general relativity. And I hope I can get on to that, but I should spend most of my time talking about the Newtonian three-body problem. I've been saying for 25 years that the road to quantum gravity goes through the Newtonian three-body problem. I hope I'll persuade you I'm not completely mad. Uh, when I say that. Now, uh, I define an instant as the shape of a, of a finite relative configuration. So, sorry, I should be on the horizontal one. So, suppose you had the Newtonian end body problem. Oh, oh where does it How do I get that? Just press the, the space bar. The space bar? Yes. Okay. And I shouldn't talk too much or something. <laughs> We, we programmed this. You what? We programmed this for this purpose. <laughs> <laughs> to stop that. Uh, so, uh, basically, the, if you had the new, uh, an end body problem, you would have the separations between the particles, you divide by, by something to make them dimensionless, so then you have a, the shape of the system. Uh, and if you had just the three-body problem, it just would be the successive shape of the triangle with specifying the mass ratios uh, of the thing. So, so that would be your, uh, your, base, your main concept. So uh, let me first of all deal with time and, and argue that time is completely unnecessary. Um, this is uh, Jacobi's geodesic, timeless geodesic principle. So Marx said, it is utterly impossible to measure the changes of things by time. Quite the contrary, time is an abstraction at which we arrive by means of the changes of things. Now the first mathematically precise formulation of the principle of least action was Jacobi in 1837 for those solutions which have one fixed value of the energy. So it's a geodesic principle in the configuration space of the system. Uh, and e is the total energy, V is the potential, and this is what I call the Jacobi kinetic energy. It's not uh, got a time in it, it's just got a completely arbitrary parameter, lambda. So this is reparametrization invariant because there's a d lambda there, then there's a squared d lambda underneath a square root there. So this is, this, you just have a curve in configuration space. Uh, and there's a, there's a metric is defined on configuration space. And the Newtonian solutions of one fixed energy are represented by geodesics of that. And these are the equations of motion, and they look horrible. Uh, but there's an obvious way to simplify them. You just choose the, the arbitrary parameter, curve parameter lambda, such that this relation holds. And then you denote it by t, and you get Newton's second law. So you, you get Newton's absolute time out of a geodesic principle by simplifying it. And what has in fact happened is, uh, so this is another way of, of rewriting that condition up there. Uh, uh, that, that's just stating it like that. 
And this looks like energy conservation. But if we're talking about the whole universe, well, this is a model of the whole universe, it's actually the definition of time, or better, duration, I would say, for the whole universe. There's an explicit expression for the increment of time, but it's derived from positions for this quantity here. And this is actually what the astronomers call the ephemeris time of isolated uh, systems. Uh, when they realized that the rotation of the Earth was not a good plot, they proposed that you should use all the dynamically relevant bodies in the solar system, and through an expression like this, they define time. So that was actually the official uh, astronomer's uh, definition of time until the public clocks came in in the 1960s, a fever is time. Um, uh, and now there's a remarkable thing about this. So if you have systems, uh, several systems, several solar systems, which are each isolated, then each of them generates an, uh, an ephemeris time in accordance with this expression here. But if one of them is going down into its potential well, the motions would increase. So uh, these clocks would not march in step because you would get bigger increments of distance uh, in one rather than another. But this thing automatically corrects for it, so that if you have two separated solar systems, the ephemeris times will march in step. They may be going at different rates, but the ratio of their rates remains constant. And that's a very fundamental thing. So this is a, a statement which is, from me actually, and you can find it on YouTube, a good plot does not march in step with time, but with all other good Clocks. You can't define a clock in isolation. In fact, I've just been reading a, uh, an article by a historian of science, uh, uh, a philosopher of science, and Einstein was very well aware of this, I discovered, when he was developing general relativity. Uh, and in fact, there are amazing correlations throughout the whole universe uh, with clocks that are marching in step. It, it, it's an incredibly interconnected thing that we live in, in the universe. Let me go on to the next one. Uh, now, the next thing I want to talk about is this idea of best matching, which Bertotti and I developed. So, suppose we just, uh, I'm going to assume we have scale. I just have, I'm going to talk about the Newtonian three body problem. I have three particles, and uh, the triangle that they form at some instant are, uh, are different, or slightly different instants. So, here's one triangle here, but it's changed its shape a little bit later. And I want to define a difference between these two things that depends only on the triangles and nothing else. And that's going to go into my action principle to define the history of, of this system, how it evolves. So basically what I do is try and uh, uh, lay one on top of the other and get them to the best matched position where this Somehow or other, you bring them as close as you can to congruence. You can't bring them to exact congruence because they're not identical. So this is the best match position as defined by this quantity. So the key quantity, first of all, is here, where you minimize this quantity here by moving around with translations and rotations until you've minimized this quantity. And if you multiply it by this quantity as well, this was going to give you Newtonian end body motions with linear momentum constraints. So first of all, the total momentum is zero. So this best matching brings the centers of mass to coincidence. And then you get a quadratic, uh, so then you also get, and this is key, the total angular momentum is exactly zero. So this is the implementation of Mach's principle. Uh, so among all the Newtonian solutions, if you derive Newtonian dynamics by this best matching method, you automatically get that your complete universe has vanishing angular momentum. However, subsystems, uh, once they get a bit isolated from other parts of the universe, can perfectly well have all values of the angular momentum. Uh, and in addition, there's a, a quadratic constraint, which is an analog of what happens in general relativity, the famous quadratic constraint in general. So, so that's the, the, the basic idea. And, and this is, wherever you do that best matching, it doesn't matter how you bring the triangles together, where you do it in this room, you get the same result all the time. So it's, it's completely independent of any background. Uh, 
So, and then actually, this is how you get inertial frames of reference in this picture coming there. What we call horizontal, that's something I call horizontal and vertical stacking. You move successive triangles into the best match position, that's horizontal stacking, and then you put a vertical separation between them in accordance with that amount of time, amount of duration that I, I spoke about there. And then you find that you've got that, that these particles then evolve exactly in accordance with Newton's law in this frame of reference which you've created by using the whole universe. So this is the classical implementation of Marx's principle in the end body problem. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, uh, and you, it, it's important that you have finitely many bodies, and it is presupposing an external scale. And it solves the, the reason why Newton introduced absolute space was he thought that there were infinitely many bodies in the universe, and he couldn't see how you could say that a point at one time was the same point at a later time, or vice versa. That's the problem of equilocality, an expression uh, due to Jürgen Ehlers. Uh, but this does, does the best matching tells you if, if, if I say this is a point now, where's the same point at a later instant? It's there. That's the, that's the way to solve that problem and find out how it is. And that gets round Newton's need to introduce absolute space, but it is critical that there's only a finite number of, of particles. Now, I just want to indicate that this exactly the same best matching becomes incredibly sophisticated and subtle in general relativity. Um, you have, it, it's all done using a three metric. Now, a three metric, GIJ, it has three coordinates, uh, three components fixed to coordinates. So it's a symmetric three by three matrix, so there's six components. Three fix the coordinates implicitly. Two fix an angle, and one fixes the volume element. And when you want to, uh, so you've got essentially, if you say the only real part is the part that determines, the only physical part is the part that determines the angle, you've got um, a terrific amount of freedom sitting around there. You've got three dimensional diffeomorphisms. And if you want to have an expanding universe, you don't do full three-dimensional conformal transformations, but one that preserves the volume. So what you're really doing, so these are meant to be two three geometries or two conformal three geometries, uh, which are nearly alike but not identical. So first of all, with diffeomorphisms, you try and compare, matching up every pair, this one with this one, or with that one, or that one, and the same over here. So you're doing this everywhere in an incredibly general way, and you're also changing the volume element at each point there. So it's, it's a colossal process. And what happens in the way that the initial value problem in general relativity is solved by York's method, leads where you start off with just angles, nothing, nothing but angles uh, in, in, in this stage there, and when you've done all this colossal best matching, you finish up with uh, uh, identifying this point, you go forward to that point there, it tells you how much proper time has evolved between there, and it tells you what the scale is. So the scale has come into this through the solution of the Lishnerich-York equation. It's an extraordinary process. Uh, Tremendous interconnection. Uh, and that all comes out of this idea of, of best matching. And it's all really, it's been sitting in general relativity since 1970-71 when uh, Jimmy York and my Irish collaborator, Neil Monaco, great friend of uh, uh, um, Bobby there, uh, comes out of this procedure. And now I want to make this observation here that Maxwell and Einstein eliminated action at a distance. So accelerations were no longer produced instantaneously by, by things there. And this, of course, is, is tremendously important. Uh, and, and you've got Einstein uh, relativity and, and no instantaneous transmission of information. However, what they brought in was uh, local constraints on the momentum. The momenta 
uh, are satisfy constraints. Now, it's not that you're sending, you can't send any information with them, but you wouldn't, it's just the same as with the Newtonian thing. If you just looked at a small part of the Newtonian universe, which is market in the way I described, nothing would lead you to realize that the, the total angular momentum is going to be exactly zero. So you've got something like this uh, at a much more sophisticated level in general relativity. So it really is implementing Mach's principle at a very profound level, general relativity. And, and it does this through elliptical laws of the instant. And I'm actually going to, uh, and it's a very beautiful theory for spatially closed universe. I'm actually going to suggest that maybe general relativity does not only the momentum, but actually puts constraints on the position. So let's go on and see if we can even get to that. Now I want to introduce the notion of shape space. Now, everybody says the universe is expanding. I think this is a lie, really. Um, it, it, it stinks. Uh, what is really happening is ratios are changing. So, uh, at the most obvious level, the typical galactic diameters divided by the typical intergalactic separations, that's tending to zero. That's the objective fact, it's the empirical fact. And to say that the universe is expanding, I, I discussed this with Gerhard Toft. He said, oh no, the atoms are getting smaller. Well, actually both are possible. It, it's just, they're both gauge choices. So, so just to stick to the fact that dimensionless ratios alone have physical meaning. So uh, S is the space of, uh, I'm introducing the notion of shape space, the space of the universe is possible shapes. So, uh, the great thing about the three body problem is that you can represent it very beautifully. Uh, this is a lovely diagram by Flavio Picardi. The shapes of a triangle uh, can be represented by two internal angles, and this is what is actually shown here. So, the, uh, the shapes of the triangle can be represented by two coordinates, latitude and longitude, on the surface of a sphere. So, on the equator here, you have collinear configurations. They, these are what are called the Euler configurations, where one particle is between the other two, and there are three options for where the one particle is between the other two. And then there are three other special places where two particles get ever so close. In the limit, they, they coincide. Uh, uh, and are sitting on top of each other. So those are, uh, uh, are six special places on the equator. So uh, what I should have said is that uh, points, each point represents a shape of a triangle. Points with the same longitude and opposite latitude are mirror images of each other. Uh, and in this representation with equal masses, the equilateral triangles are at the uh, poles. So that's plotted for equal masses, and that the, I'm going to explain the color coding in the next slide, and that I think is a very interesting one. So I now want to say, if I have a collection of particles, and I want to characterize to what extent they're clustered or spread out uniformly, can I do that in a way which is scale invariant? And the answer is, and there seems to be a I would, it's certainly not a unique way to do it, but there seems to be one way which is very obviously distinguished. So there are two quantities which are, uh, there are two lengths. So if it's going to be scale invariant, it must be a ratio of lengths. And there are two very obvious mass weighted lengths that one can choose. One is the root mean square length. So you take all the distances between the particles, you square them, you add them up, multiply it by the masses, and then you divide by the square of the total mass. That makes it uh, dimensionless in mass. Uh, and this is actually the center of mass moment of inertia, essentially, or rather the, uh, the square root of it, divided by the total mass. So this is one fundamental length. And another <coughs> one is the uh, mean harmonic length. And the inverse of the mean harmonic length is essentially the new potential. So these are two very obvious lengths that you introduce. 
And you just take the ratio of them, and we call that quantity the complexity, and you get this, this, this quantity here, which is there. And this is what is plotted here. Now, this is a very interesting thing. Uh, it has its absolute minimum at the equilateral triangle, whatever the mass is. That was the result that Lagrange found in 1772. Uh, and it goes up infinitely high at the two body collisions here, those, those points there. And it's, it's, it's also interesting too that it's, it's the negative of what is called, what the end body specialists call the shape potential. Um, the, the Newton potential does two things. It generates forces which pull all the particles to their common center of mass, uh, but it also generates forces that change the shape of the system. And they're the only ones that are visible to observers within the system, if you like. Uh, and so the shape potential, which is also called the normalized Newton potential, is, is just that part of the Newton potential which only changes the shape. So that's the one that one should be concentrating on. And it's very interesting that it, that it's, it emerges from consideration of these two purely mathematical concepts of wanting mass, weight, and length, and taking the ratio. So let's go on. Oops. I now want to uh, bring in a result which is scandalously unknown. <laughs> Very few people know about it. Which is uh, the first qualitative result uh, discovered in uh, dynamics by Lagrange in 1772. So um, he was interested, he was studying the three body problem. Uh, this is the definition of the center of mass moment of inertia. As I say, it's, it's essentially uh, equivalent to the root mean square length. I mean, they're related. That's the square. Um, now, you can show that if it's a, it's a two-line proof. If the potential is homogeneous, whoops, sorry. If the potential is homogeneous, so if you multiply the argument by a common factor, and it comes out with that factor of power k, then you say it's homogeneous of degree k. So, the, and if that's the case, then a, a, a two-line proof shows that the second time derivative of the center of mass moment of inertia is equal to the total center of mass energy minus this thing here. So that's k is the degree of homogeneity, and v is the potential. Now, if the total energy is non-negative, the center of mass energy is non-negative, the new potential is negative definite, and it has k is equal to minus 1. It follows from that that the second derivative, the acceleration of the moment of inertia, is strictly positive. And that has very profound consequences. I could argue it must completely change the way we think about the arrow of time. Uh, uh, things there. So what it means is that the moment of inertia is U-shaped upwards as a function of time. It goes through a unique minimum, which I've coined the Janus point, and it goes up to infinity in both time directions. And the dilatational momentum, now there's a quantity which we call the dilatational momentum, it's exactly analogous to the angular momentum, but it's a measure of, of the motion of overall expansion, not overall rotation, but overall expansion. So that is the, uh, the, the dilatational momentum. Uh, it vanishes once at, at, at the Jones point, and it divides every solution into two qualitatively Oh, sorry, I'm probably me messing around with things, sorry. Um, it divides every single solution. This is a qualitative result. It divides every solution with non-negative total energy in half. And by the way, it's, a, it's D, this thing, goes from minus infinity to plus infinity in either direction that you go. It's a Lyapunov variable. This means there cannot be Poincaré recurrence in this situation. And this again completely changes the statistical mechanics of the universe 
if the universe is like this from the statistical mechanics that we've all learned from Maxwell and Boltzmann and people like that. Yeah. How do you know that if it has like this, it could also do something like this or like this, right? Sorry? If you just know that the second derivative is positive, maybe it could do something like this, right? Or something like this. It doesn't have to, to go from plus infinity to plus infinity. I don't know the I think I think that's right what I've said. Um, it's it's I think I think it's right. I think it's right. Uh, let's talk about it now because uh, I'm a bit short of sleep to be totally on the ball on that one. Uh, I've talked about this many times with anybody specialists and they've never corrected me at least. Uh, right, so uh, I'm going to talk about I'm going to assume that the universe is governed by a law like this. And I call it a it's a Janus point system. Every solution divides into a unique Janus point J. The evolution is going to be time asymmetric either side of J. Arrows of time point away from J uh, in each half. And the hypothesis is that there is a law of the universe which dictates a Janus point in all of its solutions. And I just hope I can get on to show you some of the consequences of that. Um, now, Liouville's theorem is very important in that. Hamilton's equations conserve the phase space volume. That's foundation. This is hugely important in statistical mechanics. But now, if, the, if you have a system which can grow without limit, you can start a Gibbs ensemble with some things that are going faster than others, and the shape part will then grow. So this is what will happen in a system which can expand, as I've just been describing. And if that can happen, the shape, the scale part will grow, and by Liouville's theorem, the shape part must decrease. There must be attractors on shape space, and we'll see that. And I think this again is going to change the way we should think about the other part. So you see this here. So forget that part of the picture for the moment, that one there. This is just the definition of the complexity and the shape potential. So this is actually a typical solution. Flavio Mercati calculated this numerically. This is a typical three-body solution plotted as a curve on shape space. Just there is the Janus point where it goes through its minimum size and there's one branch going off this way and there's another branch going off the other way. They come around there and they spiral around. So either you can see it, they're climbing up the mountain of complexity and going up, or you can see it, they're spiraling down into the potential wells of the shape potential. And the attractor on shape space, it looks as if there's friction pulling the system into the wells of the shape potential. This is actually what is happening in an expanding universe. This is actually what is, is going on in, in Hubble expansion. And that's just a direct consequence of the evidence theory. Uh, and so far as I know, the first person who realized the importance of, uh, of attractors in, in this situation was, I think it was Abby Ashtakar and David Sloan and people, they were thinking about it in the context of inflation. In our work, in, in uh, thinking about shape dynamics, it was Tim Koslowski who first of all realized the connection between Liouville's theorem and what, the, what we've got here. Um, it's all very simple, uh, very direct. Um, so now let me tell you about the, uh, what I call the relational free body motion. Suppose, which is I think certainly in a, uh, in a Markian theory, the angular momentum is going to be exactly zero. Let us assume that the energy is exactly zero as well, and the momentum will be zero trivially because we're going to go in the center of mass. Now, it's, uh, the three-body problem is planar. So this is Newtonian interaction, and this is plotted for equal masses of the particles. It's planar. It's always planar if the angular momentum is exactly zero. So what have we got here? So all of the, it's been known for 100 years, 
that all the solutions of the three-body problem in this case uh, uh, have exactly the same form. It's not exactly what they are. So in the distant past, we put a nominal direction of time on, and in the distant past, from one direction you have a single particle coming, uh, and coming to it so in the opposite direction you have a Kepler pair. And while they're far apart, the Kepler pair is in almost perfect Keplerian motion, and this one is in almost perfect uh, inertial motion. When they get close to each other, there's always a period of non-trivial three-body interaction. And in this case, it leads to a swapping of partners. Uh, the, uh, the blue one now goes off on its own, and the green and the red one get linked up. So around here, it's, all, it's chaotic three-body motion. But as you get further away, it, it settles down into a capital pair, and it comes in as a capital pair. But if this is a model, if this is just a, a, a triple star system in the galaxy, the rest of the galaxy in the universe defines a, a rather obvious direction of time. And, and uh, you know there is a direction of time defined by the rest of the universe. But if this is a toy model of the whole universe, the direction of, of time is purely nominal. You can just reverse those uh, arrows and, and uh, nothing changes. Um, so, uh, but there's an alternative to that. Let me just go back again. So this is, this is the standard way of thinking about it. The direction of time is purely nominal. There's, there's a gauge freedom there. However, now let's, I'm going to give you the alternative thing, which is what I call one past two futures, where we actually say there are two histories, there are two stories going on here. I'm going to break up the system into what happens before uh, the three-body interaction happens, and what happens after in the normal Newtonian way of thinking. So, uh, what we have is here, we have, down here is the, the needle, so this means that the single particle is a long way from the Kepler pair, so it looks like a needle, so this corresponds to the single particle there and the Kepler pair out there. As they get closer to each other, you find that typically the system will run through all uh, particle shapes. This is where the three-body interaction is, and then it goes out the other side. But now, if we take this idea that I've developed seriously, we can say there isn't one arrow of the direction of time. There are two ones that's bidirectional. You, you, you say, uh, on the basis of these shapes, you can say there's clearly a direction. So, if I challenged my grandson who's four and a half to say what's the direction of, find the direction of time in here, just looking at what's visible, the shape of the triangle, he would say, well, it's obvious, Grandpa, there's two. Uh, there's one goes from there out in that direction, and there's another one going in the opposite direction out in that direction there. So, this is bidirectional arrows of time coming out of the simplest non-trivial dynamical system and its inevitable consequence of the first qualitative result in dynamics from Lagrange in 70. Well, it, 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 with an energy zero and angular momentum zero. So you've got uh, time based and, and moreover, the, the, um, the evolution is, is very time asymmetric. You see, it's, it's, it's completely, you go from this sort of situation to this sort of situation this very pervasive time asymmetry there. And moreover, you have things really emerging in a remarkable way, because when the capital pairs has formed, it suddenly becomes a beautiful rod through its semi-major axis. It becomes a clock. It becomes a direction. So with respect to this thing, you can establish that this thing is ever better going away in pure inertial motion. So, a Newtonian inertial frame of reference just becomes manifest before your eyes as, as it goes out there. Uh, and, and this all comes out of chaos at the, at the, at the, at the Janus point up there. Uh, so, um, and this arrow of time has nothing whatever to do with statistics or, I mean, you often hear that the arrow of time comes in through you have to have lots of systems, lots of particles in a system to get an arrow of time emerging. This is just a counterexample. You, you, you do it with the simplest non-trivial dynamical system. Uh, let me go on to the next slide. Uh, 
So now you, uh, so there's that, that's the same thing there. So you can see the Janus point now in, in how the complexity varies. So I've plotted here three quantities. This is the center of, or rather Flavio did. Uh, this is the, uh, what the center of mass, sorry, the center of mass moment of inertia looks like. That's not directly visible within the system. This is what the dilatational momentum looks like. It goes through zero just once at that point there. And this is what is actually observable. This is how the complexity changes. Now, why does it fluctuate like that? Well, that's because the Kepler pair forms with uh, a certain eccentricity. And so the two particles are sometimes closer to each other and sometimes further apart. So the steady growth is because of the overall growth of the system in the Newtonian picture. This is why you get this behavior going up there like that and that. But these fluctuations are due to the eccentricity of the Kepler pair. So that's the, uh, the story there. And I just want to be a bit challenging now, because I think this, maybe all of this does help us with, with getting to some understanding of the quantum mechanics of the universe. I'm going to talk about the age of metrology. That dawns when the orbital elements stabilize. And in this model, it happens quite quickly. Once you get out here, the, 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 the capital pen is nicely formed. So you've got rods and clocks and compasses and, and directions there. So, so that's happening out there. And I think this may be significant. I mean, a lot of people working on quantum gravity and, and the quantum mechanics of the whole universe think that all the excitement is actually in the Big Bang at the Planck length and all those things like that. We're getting a bit skeptical about that. Maybe the interesting things happen away from the Big Bang, where, where you actually have got, where you can do measurements, where you've got physical instruments, where you can do those things. Let me go on to the next slide, because I think that's it. Oh yes, here's a thousand body simulation, showing what it's like there. So now those fluctuations, because you've got, uh, there aren't really any isolated systems properly formulated here but the system is still clustering very significantly as you get further away. This is an artistic impression down here of what it looks like. So the system starts off looking like a swarm of bees all moving in random directions. But when you get away from the Janus point here, you've got clusters forming in Kepler pairs and so forth. Uh, and all of these cluster, these Kepler pairs that uh, form, they all march in step, and they remain mutually congruent with fixed relative directions. And let me just quote to you what Isaac Newton said about the solar system. He said, it is not to be conceived that mere mechanical causes could give birth to so many regular motions. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets can only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Well, actually, it comes out of Newton's laws. <laughs> in this case, yeah, absolutely wonderfully. Newton's laws did a downside more than he realized. He thought they couldn't uh, control the, uh, the perturbations of the planets on each other. And then the French mathematicians proved it one hundred years later. So, uh, I think it's, it's nice to point Newton against it. Ah, let me just make one other point here, which I think is, is, is important. Yeah. Now, that n-body problem I showed you with vanishing angular momentum and general relativity, they are both uh, dynamical theories governed that belong to Nernst's theorem part two. Are, are people familiar with Nernst's theorem parts one and two? Ask me afterwards. <laughs> But basically, they, uh, if it's Nerta 1, as Dirac showed with his constraint things there, you, you have these constraints on, on, on certain quantities. The, the total energy, the momentum, and the angular momentum are all zero. And zero, it's a very precise thing, as Schrodinger said, zero is the only number with a charter, a sort of royal privilege. So that's something... The universe as a whole is governed by this incredibly precise something. You add everything up and you get exactly zero. However, with increasing distance from the Janus point, increasingly isolated systems form. Um, 
and become ever more Hamiltonian with all possible values of the energy, momentum, and angular momentum. But they're never quite exactly conserved. So these are mere commoners. So this is, I think, at the most deep level, what I'm talking about a pervasive arrow of time is you're going from systems governed by Nerta theorem part two, where you've got infinitely, you've got Lie groups that depend upon arbitrary functions, down to Lie groups which depend upon a finite number of parameters. And so all of these, uh, these quantities, they're never exactly conserved. You never get that magical exact zero. So they're mere commoners. Uh, so, so I'm, what I'm wondering is, is, is how much of these fantastic experiments that are done here in the Bunsman Gasser really rely so, so much on this emergence phenomenon. Is quantum mechanics, in a, in a sense, emergent? And does it happen in the same sort of way as we're seeing with the classical theory? This is the challenge I, 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 I put out to you. Uh, and um, I first met Chaslav at a lovely conference we attended in South Africa at um, the uh, uh, Stellenbosch. Mm -hmm. And there was Serge Harosh there, there was uh, Anton Zeilinger, and several other people. And they were grappling with trying to interpret quantum mechanics. And at one stage I got a bit arrogant. I said, I think you guys should get up out of your laboratory and go and open the window and look out at the universe and try and get some inspiration from there. And then much later I came across this quite famous saying of John Bell, Bell to restrict quantum mechanics to be exclusively about piddling laboratory operations is to betray the great enterprise. Now I don't want to underestimate these fabulous experiments that are being done. Piddling is unfortunate, I think. But uh, I, I think one should really think about this in a much bigger perspective. At least that's my gut feeling, my, my suspicion. So let's go on from there. Uh, so this is the story of the universe according to NASA. Uh, you, you start off with sort of a big bang, and then you have quantum fluctuations and inflation, and then you bit by bit, you, then you have the dark ages, and, uh, and, and so it goes on. Um, and, and now we've got right to the stage where you have W map out there. This is really the age of metrology in, in, in a wonderful precision here. So you get growth of order information and high precision metrology. And this is so way against the growth of disorder that people normally associate with entropy. How many people here, if I may ask, show of hands, think that you can define an entropy for the universe and that it is? Is anybody going to put their hand up and say that, that you can define entropy for the universe so that it increases? One person. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of people say that. Uh, Rudolf Clausius created a huge impression in 1865 when he coined the expression entropy. Uh, and he said, there are two fundamental laws of the universe. The energy is con its energy is constant, its entropy tends to a maximum. And I think a lot of people still think that way and, and haven't really questioned it. Certainly, uh, Roger Penrose is absolutely convinced that the universe should have an entropy and it should increase, and there's plenty of other people who do as well. But I, 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 we're challenging that head on and saying there isn't, there may be an entropy-like quantity for the universe, but it decreases, and I think I've probably got just enough time uh, to, to do that. So actually, this is what uh, what we're proposing in place of the, the NASA picture, something like this. This is still not yet really got to grips with the quantum things there, but what what my collaborators show is that in certain circumstances you can go through the Big Bang smoothly. You can go through it smoothly uh, on, if you only look at the shape. The volume goes to zero in a, in a very violent way. This is a, a, it's a certain set of solutions of general relativity that this is possible. And the time reversal symmetry is respected. Let me just go on then to that. Now I just want to mention something about inflation. 
and whether we might conceivably have an alternative to inflation. This is very speculative. <laughs> I mean, you say everything is speculative, I can say. But this is even more so. But let me just show you this because this is very interesting. I mean, everybody, cosmologists say inflation is a fantastic success. It's all sorts of wonderful things. Well, virtually everything that uh, is claimed as a fantastic success for inflation was actually done with purely classical general relativity by Jim Peebles about three or four years before anybody thought of inflation. So I think that should give one pause for thought. So, uh, normally you talk about the harrison zeldovich spectrum and it's characterized in Fourier space that the power spectrum is proportional to K, to the, to the wave number. Uh, but it's very interesting uh, to ask what do these fluctuations look like in real space when you actually see it. So on the left here, you have a Poisson distribution. So a Poisson distribution is where each individual point is chosen randomly, and each next one comes in is completely random. It's, it, 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 it's, it's nothing to do with it. And you know, in, 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 with a Poisson distribution, you get surprisingly more points close to each other than you would expect. Classic example of that happened in last year and this year. Last year, there wasn't a single human being killed in an air accident, uh, a civilian air accident last year. This year, there were two serious accidents within a week of each other. And, and this is quite typical with air crashes because it's the Poisson distribution. They're essentially independent. So that's what the Poisson distribution looks like. And you see it's quite clustered. Uh, it has voids and clusters. And the harrison zeldovich spectrum like this looks much more uniform. And it's out of a structure like this this was the structure that people started with when he got those fabulous curves that we all see in the thing there, uh, 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 assuming that it was something like that, although he, he was doing it in Fourier space and not real space. These are sort of particle distributions. So the whole of the large-scale structure of the universe comes out of that. Let's go on and see how we, whether we get on with that. So now, uh, suppose we say we know that Newtonian theory is a good approximation to general relativity, at least as in a lot of occasions. Suppose we say we want to use the end body problem to mimic what happens in general relativity, and we're going to impose just two conditions. One is a rather trivial one, that the energy is non-negative. That's so that we get the expansion going on forever. And the other is that there must be something which truly models the Big Bang, which must mean that there's a total collision. All the particles must, at one point on the solution curve, be all sitting together on their common central mass. That's called a total collision. And these things, these total collisions, are of considerable interest in the end body problem. So a lot of study gone on with them. And they have very interesting things, uh, properties. So now instead of saying that the volume that the value of the, the root mean square length or the center of mass moment of inertia is arbitrary, I'm going to say that this curve must come down to exactly zero. And that can only happen at what the end body people call a central collision. At a central collision, the acceleration vectors all point towards the common center of mass. And they're all, and so it's it's just one common uh, time-dependent function. So basically you've got everything, the only force is acting on every single particle in the system is pulling every single particle to the common center of mass. So if you hold the system in such a central configuration and let it fall freely under gravity, it will fall homothetically without changing its shape and they'll all co co collide at the common center of mass. That's a homothetic motion. But very interestingly, and it's been known for a hundred years or so, that you can also have solutions which are non homothetic which are really changing their shape, but they do reach a total collision. And these are the ones that we're going to talk about, which we find very interesting. Uh, and in fact, uh, we've been discussing with... Uh, so it, been, it was said in, among anybody specialists that when you get to a total collision, you can't continue the 
Newtonian solution any further. It, it, it becomes impossible to continue. But in fact, we've discussed this with end-body specialists, and they have agreed with us that this is actually an artifact of the Newtonian parametrization by time and scale. That if you just look at how the shape changes, you can just go through a total collision and come out the other side in shape space. So uh, that's our situation about that. We don't need to go on one more left. So the ah, yes. Now the central configurations, yes. The they can only happen where that quantity. So there are two conditions for a total collision to happen. Can only happen if the angular momentum is zero of the whole system. So that's quite interesting. That's our marking condition. That's already a huge restriction on possible motion. So down to a zero measure set. But then in addition, it can only happen where that complexity function, which I showed you, is extremal. It has an extremal value. And those situations are very interesting. They have a very interesting structure. I'll show you what they look like. So in this picture here, they're platonic solids if the particles are equal, basically. So this picture here, actually, it's just a way of representing. So the particles are sitting at the center of these spheres, which have just been put in so that you can see what the, the things look like, because point particles, you couldn't see them. So this is the equilateral triangle. That's the result of the Dronach found. And then as you go up, you get these structures here, which are, are very uniform. And over here you see them as platonic solids, um, or near platonic solids. But particularly interesting is if this is this is a numerical calculation with I think this is 500 particles. Now there were, uh, this is from a paper in 2003 by Gary Gibbons as a theoretician and two uh, numerical people who, who found the absolute minima, or close to absolute minima, of these configurations. And they're incredibly interesting things. This is what they look like with that representation. As I say, the, the particles are uh, at the centers of these points there. Uh, but look at them there. Uh, and this is, a, this is a slice through it there. And what they found, they were able to find numerically the exact uh, minima for up to, I think, a thousand. But they could tell very accurately what they were like up to uh, 10,000. And basically, uh, they found there was no sign of exact crystal ordering, but they looked super homogeneous, like the harrison Zeldovich spectra in real space. Uh, so this is the question, is this perhaps a, an alternative to inflation that is purely classical, owes nothing to quantum mechanics at all? Uh, it, 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 it's certainly a Newtonian solution which comes, comes out of a total collision uh, with, where the shape potential is, is, is near its minimum. It's going to look like this. Now, one or two more things about these uh, central configurations. Um, they, it's not known whether there's only a finite number of them or there's infinitely many. But no example has ever been found where there's not a finite number. Nobody's managed to find a continuum of these things. So that's quite an interesting fact. So if there's only a finite number of them, you, you one might be able to do all sorts of interesting statistics. And these ones that are very low, near the absolute minimum, I, I would say that it, it's likely that there's lots and lots of them that are small fluctuations from it. I think it's the case of Boltzmann's great insight that when you're near thermal equilibrium, there's a vast number of states which differ only very slightly. Uh, I mean, Boltzmann's great insight was that uh, there are many more uniform states than non-uniform states. So I think it's not impossible that statistical arguments should suggest that in the end-body problem with a total collision, the great bulk of the solution should look like that. But this is still very speculative there. So is that perhaps a, a, a purely classical alternative to inflation? And when did I start? Ten past, was it? Shall I do five more minutes? Yeah, just to just tell you. Ah, yeah, that, that's just the same again. Ah, 
here's the time reversal symmetry. Um, so all known laws are time symmetric, and that even would apply to CP and T if, if you're considering the whole universe, because CP T is still uh, respected. Um, now, Boltzmann said uh, the famous words from Goethe about Maxwell's equations, but there's a wonderful book on uh, variational principles of mechanics where Cornelius Landshaw says it about Hamilton's equations. So, this has been a mystery since 1851 when William Thompson, later Lord Kelvin, wrote a paper called On a Universal Tendency in Nature to the Dissipation of Mechanical Energy. So, it, it's been a problem since then. Uh, now, I think that thinking about this has been distorted by the history of dynamics. I don't know, uh, anybody here read Charlie Carno's book? It's a terrific book, absolutely fantastic. In about six pages he lays the foundations of, of phenomenological thermodynamics. The only thing he didn't get was that one insight that heat doesn't flow spontaneously from a colder body to a hotter body. Uh, but the key thing about Carnot and all the work that developed out of Carnot, trying to understand how to make a steam engine as efficient as possible, steam is confined to a cylinder. So virtually, virtually all work since Carnot, experimental and theoretical, has presupposed the confining box, which has huge consequences. And I've looked at a great deal of the literature on the arrow of time, and I've not found, including a lot of people talking about the entropy of the universe and that it must increase, I've not found one single question of whether the universe, the expanding universe, is appropriately thought of as being in a box. If you read Roger Penrose's books and papers, you will find that he is, he doesn't say it explicitly, but he's assuming that there are Poincaré recurrences. But Poincaré recurrences can't happen in an expanding universe like I've been talking about, because there are Laplunov variables in there. So let's just go on and see what what, what is there. So th this is that the box is hugely important. Statistical mechanics was developed to understand equilibration. What is happening mechanically if you go from a non-equilibrium state to an, an equilibrated one? That's only possible in a box. If you don't have a box, the things will all just fly apart. You'll never have equilibration. Will it? Uh, Gibbs was quite clear about this in 1902 in his great book. He said, if I'm going, I'm going to do it completely generally for Hamiltonian dynamics, but if he's going to count microstates a la Boltzmann, uh, he's got to impose conceptual boxes, essentially bounded measures of configuration space and momentum space. But these are both unnatural things. I mean, are we in a box? Is the universe in a box? And I, I would say this is the reason why there's been no progress since 1851 on, on the problem of the arrow of time. It's because people haven't got away from Carlo's brilliant way of thinking about it. So what happens if you put things in a confining box? Well, it can't expand. That's why it equilibrates. But you get a point of very recurrences. Uh, so, uh, basically, the system is going to be in, in a state of heat death for a huge amount of time. Uh, and then every now and then, if you're lucky, you will get a dip. Uh, and then, then it might be possible to have intelligent life there. And here's this famous statement of Boltzmann from 1895. The universe is, this is what he assumes, the universe is and rests forever in thermal equilibrium. Only near deep entropy dips are worlds where visible motion of life exists. The direction of time towards the your improbable state will be experienced as the past. And he had this very famous inclusive debate with several uh, about the time my father was born in 1895, 96, 97. Uh, uh, and uh, I mean, he had he. I mean, out of this came this very important insight, which people highly praise, that time has no pre-existing direction. It, it, in this case, it comes out of increasing entropy. That's what Bergman says. The direction of time is defined by the direction of increasing entropy. But also, it has, he doesn't quite say this explicitly, but each dip has, as we have found in the three body problem, a one past and two futures interpretation, and then it's a local channels point. 
So why are the past and the present so different? So Boltzmann and some people say there was a huge fluctuation from thermal equilibrium in the direction we call the past. Many people, Roger Penrose particularly, say the universe began in the Big Bang with an extremely low entropy. And these are not explanations, but they're admissions of defeat. And nothing is more profound than the fact that I was born, and within about 10 or 15 years I'm going to die. <laughs> this is the most profound aspect of our existence when we treat it from the human point of view. Um, and modern science completely fails to explain that. So, so now, what about defining an entropy-like quantity for the universe? So we're going to do it in scale in varying terms. Now, the, what Boltzmann did, and it, it, it secured his position forever in science, was first of all, he introduced what we now call a, 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 what is it? a state function, like the energy or something like this, a state function. And then he counted all the microstates that are compatible with that state function. So we actually have a state function in the form of our complexity. These are the contour lines of, of our state function. Those are the contour lines of our complexity. And then you can say that the count of microstates is either the length of that contour, or if you want to say, I can only determine it to a certain accuracy, it's the area between it. So this is a configurational entropy. This is a count of microstates. And lo and behold, what does the dynamical solution do? It basically decreases the lengths of the contours go down as you go around. So the entropy-like quantity for the universe is decreasing. But that's not incompatible with the second law of thermodynamics because what that decrease of the entropy-like quantity for the whole universe, it, and we call it the entaxi, so that it's got a different name, is that it's, it's, it corresponds to the fact that self-confined subsystems of the universe are forming. So here are these clusters forming, and basically they form all at once all over the whole universe, in our picture, with a low Boltzmann entropy. They're self-confined, so they then become subject to something like the Poincaré recurrence, and initially the entropy will grow. So that is how the second law of thermodynamics for subsystems of the universe can increase, whereas the entropy-like quantity for the whole universe is decreasing. And you get that in fact. So that's com very compatible. Order is increasing. Uh, it doesn't look like increasing disorder that, that people say. Uh, so that, that's how we, we, we see it. Uh, have I got anything more to show you? Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. So, what we're claiming is that the law of the universe could create conditions for all steam engines to exist, and then man discovers entropy by maximizing their efficiency. But it needs to understand how steam engines can get there, you have to go out and look at the whole universe and think about its whole history. So that's the end of my talk. <laughs> and I just about did it. You talked about shapes, yeah. and I see if one um, uses uh, projective geometry, there's a nice description going back to Mercus. So he used something called very simple coordinates. That's like a natural way of describing. That could well be, I tell you, uh, I benefited hugely uh, from a French mathematician called, uh, he's at the Observatory in Paris, Alan Alboui. Uh, I keep on meaning to go back to Paris and try to get him to do work with us. But he's, um, uh, he's very interested in, in that sort of projective things like that. By the way, he is, he is famous, he's world famous among uh, end body specialists for, I can't remember whether it's for n equals four or five, the, the number of central configurations each one that can lead. So in the three body problem, the Grange found the equilateral triangle and Euler found those Euler collinear configurations. 
And I'll believe it's famous for having established the precise number that there are either for n equals 4 or 5. This is, this is regarded, you know, he's sort of spoken on with great respect for this, this terrific mathematical achievement. Uh, and there's a, an American mathematician called Donald Sari who talks about the problem of central configurations as being a problem for the 21st century. It, it is very interesting. And the other thing which is very interesting is that it, if that is the right way to think about it, it, it takes, in many ways, the whole essence of dynamics or, or what is the information that is in a dynamical history it removes it from dynamics and puts it purely in geometry and in mathematics. He makes that point about central configurations. Uh, so I think that's quite an interesting thought. I mean, you know, with information and so forth. Where is, where is information sitting and, and, and so forth? I mean, uh, let, let me say one other thing. That if you have shape space, uh, if you have a point in shape space and a direction, not, not with an arrow, but it can go another direction. Uh, if you have the energy, total energy zero and the total angular momentum zero, there's just one thing which you cannot then encode and uh, that you can't encode in a shape and a direction, and that is the proportion of energy in overall expansion compared with the total kinetic energy. Um, so that there's always a one parameter family of solutions that peel off from a point in a direction in shape space. Very, very profound fact, I think. Uh, and it was thinking about this that, that led us to all these ideas about the arrow of time. Was this, this significance of the Janus point as well. That, that, uh, at the Janus point, you, you need more information that's further away to, to, to fix that one thing there. Um, so I think this opens up potentially I'm not aware of anybody thinking about things this way. I'm not aware of anything in canonical quantum gravity going there. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, we're the ones who've been saying that you should look at things in terms of shape. Uh, but the importance of shape has is, is been known since York's work. I mean, York said that the picture which emerges of local shapes, angles, interacting with each other and the longitudinal scale of space. Well, we've removed the, that interaction with the longitudinal scale of space because basically if you've solved how the shape changes, you can then find, find how the scale and the time change. Uh, this, go, this is an extension of what Lagrange did. In, in seven, Lagrange's paper is just incredible. What he did was he assumed Newton's laws were correct and he then re-expressed them in terms of the separations between the particles. He kept the notion of absolute time and of absolute scale, but he did it relationally. And then he showed that the equations become third order in time. And then he showed that if you solve, if you solve those equations and find them as functions of the time, you can then find how the system is moving how the orientation of the triangle is changing in absolute space and how the size of the triangle is changing in absolute space by quadrature. You don't have to solve any more equations. And what we're now doing, uh, my particular Tim Koslowski is showing, that you, you, you should take the Grange's step, two step, go two step further. So you should take out absolute time and absolute scale. And, and then you're down to the, the absolute minute. Then you really are talking Unless you start challenging angles, uh, you're down to the, the bedrock. Uh, and I think that's interesting. But it's, it's an interesting fact that people just don't think about this. I, I would say the way dynamics is taught is a scandal. You, 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 you start at 15 or 16, you're taught Newtonian kinematics, then you learn Newton's laws, then you solve the two-body problem, then you jump straight to rigid body theory, then you do the Grotian and Hamiltonian theory. You never do a proper dynamical problem. You never talk the three-body problem or the n-body problem. And that's where dynamics really begins. It's an extraordinary state of affairs. Uh, and, and nobody tells you how to determine an inertial frame of reference. Newton promises at the start of the Principia of the famous scholar. He says it is indeed difficult to determine the absolute motions from the observable relative motions. But how that is to be done 
I shall show you in the treatise to which thou follows, for to that end it was that I composed it. But he never returns to it. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody else did until the 1880s, when Ludwig Langer in Germany did, and uh, Tate in Scotland did. Uh, and they solved the problem for purely inertial motion. But that's, that's, that's uh, even that is very interesting. But it just shows how, how how a, a, a really fundamental thing, what is time, what is space, is just not addressed in dynamical text, in, in dynamical courses or textbooks. It's, it's an extraordinary, and it's just to do with this phenomenal success of, of Newton in, in, in dictating the, the way it stands. And even Einstein, I would say, didn't shed that because he still is assuming sort of absolute space and time locally in, in the small. I've been yeah. So, in some of your last slides, you criticized the standard view that the universe has been, goes to the Big Bang, some special state that people sometimes call low entropy state. Yeah. But I don't see how you can, in your approach, do differently because you also have to claim that there was a special state at some point where your complexity measure was small somehow. So, you still have to make an assumption. That there was this one point in time, that Giuliano's point, for example. Ah, oh, yes. No, that's very good. Thank you very much, because I, I was rushing to finish. Is there a difference? Yeah, the, the answer is we, we are suggesting that at the Janus point, because if there's a big bang, it will actually be a Harrison Zeldovich spectrum. So the positions are fixed by that. And it will be, a, a, it will, the, the velocity distribution of the particles will be Maxwellian. We're actually applying exactly both Mannion things to the Janus point. And we, I think we can do that. Because actually, if you think about the Maxwell distribution, uh, for different energies, they're actually all the same. The Maxwell distribution is about uh, proportions with different energies. What, uh, you know, if, if you divide it up in, in different ways. I mean, this fantastic paper of Boltzmann in 1877, he does it all with seven particles. <laughs> and he puts them in bins. He says, I'll, I'll assume that their, their energies are quantized, they can be in bins. So he has seven bins or eight bins, I forget what it is. And with just those particles, he gets a phenomenal effect already. There are the, the number of ways you can fill the bins with, 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 with their, the seven if, if you put them all in one bin, if you, if you put all the energy in, in just one particle. Uh, but if you if you look for the maximal round, suddenly you find you get, I think, over 4,000 or something ways of filling up the bins. And it's already a, not too bad an approximation to the maximum distribution. Uh, it, 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 it's fantastic. So we're just doing it. So it's really the direction. So the momentum is a direction with a magnitude. And so basically what Boltzmann was doing was a direction in configuration space with a nominal magnitude. So, so all of the Maxwell distributions are the same. You, you transform, you can either, you can go to them by changing, from one to the other by changing the units, or, or you can, if you've got two systems, one over here that's sort of nearly maximal and one over there is maximal, well then you use the kinetic energy here to meaningfully say this has got twice as much kinetic energy. But, but we're talking about ratios and things like that. But basically, we are arguing that the most probable state of the Janus point is the harrison zeldovich spectrum and thermal equilibrium to a very good. And if we, if we trust the results from the CFB, it's phenomenal. Now, I mean, this is, this is very speculative. You know, I'm trying to, at my age, <laughs> being independent, not searching a job, I can make a fool of myself by, by making such suggestions. But, uh, it would be absolutely beautiful if, if that could be, being here in the Boltzmann Gasse, to use Boltzmann's ideas of the Big Bang to solve, because he lost the battle really with Sermelo. He didn't, he didn't win the argument with Sermelo. By the way, this would, <laughs> well, that can't be true, but I came across a lovely story. I looked up Sermelo on Wikipedia. I came across a story where he was dying of cancer in, in Freiburg in the Black Forest. 
and all the logicians of the world have gathered for the poor man to come and see him. And somebody brought the bad news that his, his great theorem was not correctly proven. So who was going to tell Sam that it was the dreadful news? So Bertrand Russell was there. So Russell, you must do it. Yeah. Russell thought for a bit, and then he said, "No, I should let him die happy." <laughs> <laughs> it must be apocryphal. That's a nice story. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean it's it's a fantastic story. But why why have people kept thinking in a box? Just it, it's, I, I find it fascinating. People just don't seem to realize that it's a different situation. And that once there are attractors, it's quite different. The universe goes from disorder to order. Perfect. I mean, just, just go back to that. that, that because thing from one doesn't have a boundary. Hmm? One doesn't have a boundary. So, how, so, the, so the whole idea of not having a box sort of doesn't make sense. Ah, uh, this is the wonderful thing about going to shape dynamics because the uh, the, con the Newtonian configuration space has, is not compact. It has, and that's just the scale variable. It's just, it's just the, the scale variable that does that. Once you, once you quotient with respect to scale, you get a compact space. Shape space is a compact space. So the universe makes its own box when, it's, when, you, when you look at what is observable. So, I mean, that's why you see that, that I, that's why I say, the road to quantum gravity is through the Newtonian three-body problem because you, you, you saw shape, the shaped sphere. There it was. You saw it with your eyes. It's, it's a compact space. So that's why we can do it. So it's, it's much more natural. It still wants the universe to be spatially closed, I think. I think these <coughs> relational market ideas are difficult to implement. So that's a big conjecture. But, but I, think it's, I think that's the answer. Since you were mentioning uh, especially closed uh, universes, so in that case, when you're looking at that point and uh, uh, part of the problem, is there still a unique uh, Jan, Jan's point, or Sorry. can there be many? And, uh, like the so are we, talk, are we talking about Newtonian theory or general relativity? Well, in, in Newtonian the theory, theory, theory the space is in, 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 in Newtonian, well. Let, let's stick with Newtonian theory, first of all, in Euclidean space. If the energy is not negative, there's always a Janus point. Uh, so that's there. Uh, if you, there's, a, there's a fascinating thing called the, the, the BKL conjecture in general relativity. You, who's familiar with the BKL conjecture? This is, I mean, the, the singularity at the Big Bang Basically, there seem to be two, this increasing evidence that there are two types of singularities. One is oscillating, where the system, uh, in the standard story, it oscillates and it goes through infinitely, it goes infinitely far in shape space. It just goes on forever in shape space. You get this in the famous Bianchi 9 solutions, the non quiescent ones. If you add, that's pure geometry. If you add a massive scalar field, you then get a finite number of oscillations. You get what's called quiescent Bianchi 9. And now, a few, about a decade ago, Anderson and Rendell proved that it, it doesn't have to be just a, 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 the Bianchi 9 is the analog of the three body problem. It's got two shape degrees of freedom. But uh, this would go all, all the way across. Uh, a space like hypersurface at each space point. Who's heard of asymptotic silence? These are very... I mean, look at asymptotic silence in, in Wikipedia. Uh, so what happens... The evidence... This is a conjecture which these Russians, Bialyabin, Kalatnikov, and Lifshitz put forward some 40, 50 years ago. But the evidence for it is getting better all the time. And basically what happens is you get to the Big Bang. The Big Bang, if, if it's right, if it's increasing evidence for it, the Big Bang is a space-like singularity. And as you approach it, uh, the light cones become, instead of being flat as they are in Newtonian theory, or 
the light cones in there, the light cones close off. And the dynamical evolution, instead of being governed by partial differential equations, becomes governed by ordinary differential equations, which is called velocity dominated. And so basically, what happens at each point becomes completely independent of what happens to dynamics at other points there. Uh, and, but there are still constraints that are satisfied here, there are still special constraints, but the, the dynamical equations decouple. That's called asymptotic silence, because spatially separated points no longer talk to each other. And moreover, here you can have what's called a constant mean curvature uh, foliation, which is just what we want in our shape dynamics. So this is, so our conjecture, of the, our hope at the moment is that if, and we don't think that anybody's thought about looking at this, is what would it look like then, what, what, is, what does the geometry look like if the VKL conjecture really is right as you go to the Big Bang? Would it look like Hamilton, uh, Harrison's own language? If it is, it would be absolutely phenomenal. Completely change cosmology. So this, this is a wild hope. Uh, I think